thanks for joining us today. I'm just going to jump in and lead us off, uh, and then I'll turn it over uh, to the uh, next speaker. Uh, my name is Brian Vance. I'm the Hanford Site Manager. Um, I really do appreciate you joining us here today uh, for an important um, important meeting, an important event, important discussion uh, in recognition of Native, Native American Heritage Month. I think that's an important um, aspect of the work we do here at Hanford. I'm grateful for the opportunity to kick this off. Uh, I think all of you recognize in 1990, President Bush um, declared the month of November as Native, Amer Native American Heritage Month. Uh, now each November we take time to celebrate the history, culture, and the traditions of American Indians and Alaska Natives. Uh, DOE Hanford is honored to host this session today with presentations from two of the four uh, Native American nations with whom we regularly interact and consult with in carrying out our important uh, cleanup mission here at the Hanford site. Uh, the de department recognizes that the Hanford site is located on lands historically utilized by regional tribal nations, including the Confeder Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation, the Nez Perce Tribe, the Confederate Confederated Tribes of the Yakima Nation, and the Wanapum. Um, thanks to our presenters and everyone who is participating today to enhance our collective understanding of the history and perspectives of the Native, Amer Native American nations who are engaged in shaping the future of our cleanup mission here at the Hanford site. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to uh, the next speaker, speaker. I believe it's uh, Gabriel. Thanks, Brian. Uh, Mr. Vance, uh, uh, Tatsmewi, uh, good morning. That's the nest purse for, for good morning. Uh, my name is Gabriel Bonney, and I am the uh, H. Smith Tribal Affairs Program Manager. Uh, subcontracted through uh, Indianized LLC, uh, who is a local uh, Tri-Cities business. I am a member, uh, a tribal member enrolled at the Nez Perce Tribe. Uh, I'm also descended from the uh, Hopi Tribe and the Gila River Indian community, uh, community of Arizona. As Brian, uh, Mr. Vance said, we are gathered here virtually to help celebrate and honor uh, Native American Heritage Month uh, this month of November. Uh, if you uh, for, for the month uh, previously, we have uh, had uh, social media posts uh, on the Hanford social media sites, uh, and please view those if you have not seen them yet. Uh, today, we we are honored to uh, host this lunch and learn with two excellent presenters presenters from the local tribes, as as uh, they do represent the Nez Perce Tribe of Idaho and the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation. Uh, now, you know, we will begin, we'll just get right in. We'll begin our program with our first presenter um, as kind of ground rules for this. Uh, we, we ask if you have a question to, to the presenters to please put them in the chat box as they're giving their presentation and we will uh, have a question and answer period after both presenters have, presenters have given their presentation. Uh, we look forward to their presentations and so we start out. Uh, the first presenter is uh, Solo Green. Solo comes from the Nez Perce Tribe and works in their Environmental Restoration and Waste Management Division of uh, Natural Resources, uh, the department there at, for Natural Resources. He's an education specialist and I've known him for many years and I look forward to his presentation. So go ahead, Solo. It's a privilege to be here this morning to have this opportunity. I'm thankful that we could um, sit at the same table and share some of our history, our culture, some of our values and some of our ways with you. And um, I was asked to open up with a prayer and I'm not sure if, if that happened already or not. Um, so I just wanted to, to double check with Gabe or with somebody if, if that's still. Yeah, go ahead. So we'll go ahead. And All right. Thank you. Um, before I actually say the prayer, though, um, because we are a sovereign nation, 
and this is a meeting or a presentation. Um, if you guys don't mind, I'd like to sing one verse of our flag song in recognition of Native American Indian Heritage Month. And it's just, our flag song is equivalent to the national anthem of the United States of America. But this is our song, and I'm going to just sing one verse of it so we could kind of get the feel of who we are and where we come from and why we're even here today. So I'm going to sing this, the flake song for all of you and for this gathering today. <clears throat> Thank you for this beautiful day that you have given us. We thank you for this gathering. We thank you for this time. We thank you for this place. We thank you for each and every one of us that are able to be here today, to have this opportunity to sit together, to share, to receive, but also to give. Today we're thankful for this beautiful day that you have blessed us with. We thank you for this land, this earth, the air, the water, all the natural resources, all elements. We thank you for all the people of humankind, of mankind. And we thank you for this beautiful day and we ask you for blessings. We ask you for covering and we ask you to be with us during this beautiful day that you have given us. We ask you to bless this gathering, bless this meeting. Bless each and every one of us that are here in our families in the land that we come from. So today we give you all the praise, all the glory, all the thanks for this beautiful day and for this time and for this place. Imakis cuts you out. Yeah. Yo, Kolo. Thank you. Um, I'm glad to be here. I'm really thankful for this opportunity. And some of the things I wanted to talk talk about and touch on today is we are we are of this land one of our great chiefs from the dreamer faith his name was tohu hozu he once said the earth is part of my body i belong to the land out of which i came she is my mother and if you really think about that that makes a lot of sense of who we are of what we do our values our culture in a way we do certain things. The earth is part of my body. I belong to the land out of which I came. She is my mother. 
So pretty much everything that we do on this earth, even today, involves the relationship and the connection that we have with the land and the earth, but also the responsibility that we have to be stewards, caretakers, and managers of the land and the earth, as well as the resources that are upon it. You know, and and today, you know, we we live in a society and we live in in a world where everything is about the quick fix. We want everything right now. And with technology and the way things are today, we could get pretty much everything we want right now. But with with our culture, with our values and with our ways, you know, it, there was always a reason why we did certain things a certain way. You know, we have when we go hunting, when we go fishing, when we go gathering, we do thir- we do things a certain way at a specific time. Because with with native people, especially the nest person, I know um, Juan X is on here as well. But with a lot of our tribes, you know, there are those unwritten rules or the laws that we have and these are rules and laws that were passed down from generation to generation and things that we follow today because there's a right time to do something and there's also a time not to do certain things like hunting like fishing like gathering and these things are really important and are based on the seasons as we know, as all of us on here know, the seasons are always changing. And with the changing of season, changes the environment, changes the temperature, changes the, the atmosphere, and those kind of things. And so one of the things that our people have done over the years and for generations is we migrated and we traveled according to the seasons because we didn't have the luxury as we do today to get on our cell phone or get on our computer or our laptop or whatever it is and order things and pay with our credit card. We had to follow the seasons and it was the seasons that dictated where we were going to be and what we were going to do. And so those things still apply to us today when it comes to hunting, when it comes to fishing, when it comes to gathering and doing certain things, our ceremonies. You know, one of the things I was looking at one of my um, old emails um, earlier today, and I was reminded of some of the resources in our involvement and how we're connected to Hanford. Because a lot of people today, they don't understand or they don't realize why we're connected and why we're involved with Hanford. And one of the things that they don't realize or understand is when we created the treaties with the United States government back in 1855, you know, these were included in that and it was because of Looking Glass. Looking Glass came from Buffalo country and he went to Walla Walla, Washington where the gathering was being done and he rode in with some, some several of his warriors. And that song I sang earlier, the flake song was the song that he was singing when he entered that encampment. And they rode around and they were singing that song and to show honor and respect to who Looking Glass was, they all stood up and honored him and respected him in that way. But it was because of Looking Glass words why we have usual and accustomed areas and why we're involved with Hanford and why we're we're still involved with Celilo and other places off the current reservation. And it's the resources in the land that we're connected to. And we have place names for those specific places like Rattlesnake, like Gable Mountain, like the the fish, the animals, the birds, the plants, the resources. We have names for those specific things because they have meaning and they have a relationship to who we are as a people. And that's part of our identity. That's why we're involved with Hanford. That's why we're over there. And, you know, the the ceremonies that we have and one of the the biggest ceremonies that we have as native people and as Nest person, Nimipu people 
is the ceremony of our Waikin. And Gable Mountain and Rattlesnake was a big part of that. The, in search of your Waikin, what you do is you go sweat, you pray, you fast, and you go to these specific places in search of your Waikin or your guardian spirit to find out who you are, but also to identify what gifts, what talents, what abilities you have that you possess. And that helps determine the purpose and the destiny of your life and how you are utilized within your tribe, your band, your family, or your own people. And so when we talk about Hanford and when we talk about our ceremonies, some of these things are really important to us because that's part of guidance and direction that we have. As Native people, we've always been spiritual people. We've always prayed. We've always fasted. We've always believed in, believed in a creator, a great spirit, a Haniwa. And so these things are really are part of our spirituality and part of who we are. And another part of that is the way of the sweat. A lot of people, we sweat every day. We heat up the rocks. We take the rocks inside the sweat lodge, inside the sweat house. So we build an altar. We burn incense. We use water, kus. And water, as, as a lot of people know, is water is life. You can't live without water. Nothing grows without water. And so these things are really important to our way of life and what we do today and how we live today. Unfortunately, as, as we know over time, the land landscape has changed. Travel has changed. The resources have changed. And I know the next presenter is gonna talk about climate change and the impacts that it has had on who we are and the things that we do. So I'm not gonna go too far into that but it has the temperatures, the different seasons, the different environments. It has changed, the landscapes have changed, and it's hard for, for us to always adapt, to keep adapting, but that's how we live. That's how, we're, how we survive as we adapt. And one of the things that I wanted to mention in regards to the, to the sweat, Gable Mountain, and rattlesnake in search of your waikin. You know, you'd go on top of those mountains and you'd pray and you'd fast and you'd seek a vision or a word or something that would identify with you or something that the creator, the Lord, the great spirit or the honeywatt would give you for guidance, for the direction and even for identity. And so these things are really important, but also the way of the sweat. Sweat is really Im important to us to take care of ourselves in a good way, to wash and cleanse ourselves physically with the steam, with the water, washing ourselves off, but also mentally, emotionally, socially, and spiritually, we go there to wash and cleanse ourselves inside and outside. And to take care of ourselves to relieve and release stresses, worries, anxieties, but also to heal our bodies, our muscles, our joints, our ligaments, our tendons, our bones, and those kinds of things. And so they are really important to us. And we still do those things today. And one of the things that that we've been taught and something that has been passed on from generation to generation is when you go hunting, when you go fishing, when you when you go gathering, you only take what you need. You don't go out there and harvest everything. Because we always we're always thinking ahead to the next generations that will follow after us. And those things are are really important to to our survival, but also to our people into our ways. There's something I read the other day. It said, teach me so I could remember and so your great grandchildren will not forget. 
So our teachings and our ways are always in regards to the future and, and continuing to pass those on to our children and the next generations. One of the things that my dad shared with me, and I'll always remember this, and as an educator, as a coach, as a dad, as an uncle, and as a papa now, one of the things that my dad shared with me a long time ago before, before he passed on, he said, son, he said, those gifts, those talents, those abilities, that knowledge, those experiences, and that wisdom that was passed on to you, it wasn't given to you to keep as our to keep as your own. It was given to you to share and to give to your children and to pass on to the next generations. He said, share it and give it as much as you can. Because when it's your time, when it's your time to leave this earth when it's your time to pass on you don't keep that knowledge that information that wisdom with you it's passed on and it keeps going and so these are some of our teachings and these are some of our our ways and our identity as Nes purse as nimi poo people is to pass these things on but again the going back to hunting fishing and gathering and only taking what you need. We always have known that we're the stewards and caretakers of the land and the earth. If we continue to take and take and take and take, what do we leave for our children and the next generations? What do we leave for the animals, the birds and the fish? Everything is interconnected or interrelated in one way or another. And that's why we look at, that's the way we look at things holistically, mentally, physically, spiritually, emotionally, socially. We look at things holistically, the land, the air, the water, the earth, the animals. Now we haven't been doing a very good job if if you look around, you look at the land, you look at the earth, the air is polluted, the land is contaminated. The animals are getting different diseases that we have no control over. The waters are contaminated. And if you really think about it, if the land, the air, the water, and the resources if they're contaminated, then we're contaminated. And from a tribal perspective, and something that's really important to us, is, is taking the best care of the land and the earth that we can. Because if the land and the earth is contaminated, the animals, the birds, the fish, and the resources that we harvest, to feed ourselves, to feed our families, they're contaminated. And so with the, the Hanford Nuclear Reservation and with DOE and with the National Forest Service, with all these different agencies that we're connected to, that we're involved with, it's important for all of us, not just Native people, but it's important for all of us to start looking at the bigger picture because we're in this together as native and non-native people we're in this thing called life together and if we're going to continue on with this life and if we're going to continue on this path as native and non-native people and if you want the best for your children and your children's children, we have to start doing a better job being stewards, caretakers, and managers of this land and this earth, or else we're not gonna be here very much longer. And these are some of the things that, that we need to, to talk about. These are some of the things that we need to pass on and share with each other. Because today, it isn't Western science versus traditional ecological knowledge anymore. It's Western science 
and traditional ecological knowledge. And with our with our collaboration, with our cooperative agreements, with our connection and with our relationship. These are the reasons why it's important for us to educate our children in science, technology, engineering and math so we could take better care of the land and the earth. And we can only do a better job on our reservations, on our usually in the custom areas and in this, and in this country if we collaborate services, if we re receive funding to, to send our kids to college, to the university, to get educated so they could get their education at these different places. And they could come back home and they could go to DOE, they could go to EPA, they could go to these different agencies, share their knowledge, their wisdom and their experiences as it relates to who we are as a people. And that's why I wanted to talk about we are of this land. And I'll quote to Hu Huzu again as I as I close out today. The earth is part of my body. I belong to the land out of which I came. She is my mother. And I want to thank you for this opportunity and this time. And I hope hopefully I didn't take too much time away from the next speaker, but I really appreciate this opportunity. And, and I want to thank you and, and Gabe, thanks for asking me to be a part of this. I appreciate it. Imakis cuts you out, yeah. All right, thank you, Solo. Uh, so it's always a good, great word when you when you speak and he, Solo goes around the country. Uh, he's, he's very known not only regionally, but nationally for uh, his presentations on, on, on the land, what we do. And I used to be his former boss, so I know he's, he, he's great at giving uh, great presentations. So uh, next, our next presenter is uh, Winnix Redout. She comes from the, the CTIR or the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation. And she has a, uh, a presentation that she'll load up and, and give that really, I believe will coincide great with uh, the words that Solo just gave. So go ahead, Winnix. Tatsmewi Inam Latewa Kahimima Inam Wanakisa Winnix Wawakia Alp Alp. Hello, my name is Winnix Redout. And Winix means it echoing through a mountain canyon as it rises from the ground. And my last name is uh, Red Elk. I um, and definitely moved from Solo's presentation. I've known Solo since I was a young, a, a young girl and very close with his family. And I am so glad that I suggested that he went first because we have to lead with our traditional knowledge and that connection to the land and how we look at that and we're taught from our our Tamunwa, our Tamalwit that the foods are the first thing that comes forward and first and we lead by those and the foods, our culture and the things we do revolve around that. And so today I'll be kind of going over our first foods and a little bit of the relationship from climate and our climate adaptation plan. And it's a, a kind of a new presentation that we started. And so I, we thought that'd be a good time for us to kind of uh, start delivering it. And this presentation is actually about an hour and a half long. And it really, uh, me and uh, a coworker who, who name is Colleen Sanders, who's our climate adaptation planner. And so I'm going to be briefly covering her her sections and and I paired this presentation down. So if for some reason you guys want us to do a, a in depth presentation related to our first foods and climate change um, for Department of Energy or anyone else, you know, let us know and we can really go over this in depth. But this is just kind of a brief touch because I know I gave the first foods presentation multiple times to DOE and I really wanted to do something a little bit different. And so what I'm going to talk about today is our out out tokata, and that is kind of representation of the word for first foods. 
Outney is talking about a sacred law, the first of everything and the sacredness of those foods that when we are discussing first foods and we're discussing these resources, this is the beginning for us and the reciprocal responsibility and those connections to that. This is our law. And so the Confederate tribes of the Umatilla Inner Reservation um, signed a treaty in 1855, which combined the Cayuse, the Umatilla, and the Walla Walla people. And right here on this map, you see that this is the boundaries of the reservation. And this is it's kind of split because there was things that happened through history where um, this side of the reservation was cut off. So the think, Dr. Brown. Are you so your presentation, you're, you're on a, you're on a, a Windows screen, so if oh. you need, probably need to hit, hit the right box to have your presentation pop up. Okay. Hold on, let me just pull it down. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay, let's. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Is that showing the screen? Yes. Okay, is that showing the main slide? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So that has the, the is the full screen going now? Yes. Okay. Oh, sorry about that. And so, um, basically, we have 6.4 million acres that was seeded that we seeded. Okay. Um, reserving our rights in Northeast Oregon and Southwest Washington, or Southeast Washington. And with these rights, we have the exclusive right of taking uh, fish, hunting, gathering roots, berries, and pasturing our livestock on our unclaimed lands and some other rights that come with us. But those are kind of the main ones that we um, go out and secure those treaty rights with. And the important part is that tribes never gave up their rights to hunt fish to gather and do those things we retain them and those original rights and we never gave away those water rights traditionally this is kind of a density map that kind of shows some of the movement and we're currently working on updating this because we were traveling kind of further beyond this but when you see this brown area we're accessing this 6.4 million acres and going all the way over to portland area and moving all the way over through Mo uh, montana to uh go hunt and up into Canada, all the way down to Utah. We're following that salt trail down below. And all tribes had a very vast, expansive area that were lo locating foods. And when we were moved to reservations, it kind of, basically what it did is it stopped us from being able to access those areas where we had to gain permission and then the things that happen and so we lost connections to some of those foods and some of those teachings that go along with that and today we have all of our tribes are working to reconnect with those food sources reconnect with those cultural areas because those foods and those resources need that connection with our people because the way that we harvest and we gather we do it in a way that makes those populations more sustainable and makes them we're taught to gather and to dig roots and to turn the ground in a way that those resources become more productive. So today we're going to talk about our Department of Natural Resources has adopted our traditional ecological knowledge. They took the story of the creation story of how when Creator created everything, he first placed water, salmon came next, next the animals the roots and the berries and they gave themselves to one another and they spoke to the people in return um giving themselves up and us also giving ourselves where we go and harvest and we celebrate them and we honor them and the story of that is quite extensive when you kind of break it down but the creation of dnr's um, first Foods mission is based off of that traditional law, and that is the law of the land. When you're talking about an unwritten law, you're talking about the law of nature, like where the, the sun rises in the east and it sets in the west. It never diverts its path. Just as the salmon, they're born in the streams, they go out to the ocean, 
they stay there for several years, develop, and then they come back home. That is their natural law. They will never divert of that. That is a natural law, a law of nature. And Native Americans, we are bound by that because of the promise that they gave to each to one another because we are part of them as they are part of us, as they nourish us, that when we go back into the ground, we also nourish the ground, nourish the plants and nourish them. And so it's this process going back and forth. Our Department of Natural Resources works to protect, restore and enhance the tribe's first food, which is uh, chush, water, nusuch, salmon, yamish, deer, Chaush, the biscuit root, and Wiwinu, the huckleberry, for the perpetual cultural, economic, and the sovereign benefits of the Confederated Tribes of Umatilla Inner Reservation. We accomplish this by utilizing traditional ecological knowledge, the knowledge of the people, and that cultural knowledge and science to inform two things. First, the population and habitat management goals and actions, and natural resource policies and regulatory mechanisms. In the past, when our director is first looking at um, our natural resources and how we were managing those. It was really heavy on water and salmon. And when he took over the department, he wanted to have a mission statement to help guide department and natural resources in a way that we're utilizing the knowledge of our people first and mirroring that and then putting science on top of that to make us managers in two ways, using that traditional ecological knowledge and Western knowledge and how do we find that? And what we were finding, it was really hard to get our non-natives, even within our own organization, to buy into that. And so he worked on looking at, when you go to the longhouse, you see us put our foods out in a specific order, and everything was already there. So he used the story of the first foods and lined up how we do things in the relationship and to help drive us to be better managers related and responsive to our cultural teachings first and the science. And so when you look at that, tribes have always protected mm -hmm. the resources. They have restored in the way by the way that they harvest, the way they go out and restore and enhance those first foods by an example using fire to burn areas such as huckleberry fields or root areas or promote fire and burning out areas where the forest is becoming encroached or there's weeds coming in there to promote open prairies for our big game. And we have also restored streams in a way we have oral tr traditions, oral stories that talk about our leaderships and our bands within areas up in um, parts of our tribe where they noticed that a salmon run was depleting. And in that run, they called all the leadership together and all the band members together. And they said that we will no longer mm -hmm. fish these streams for about a certain length of time. And then they went to a neighboring stream that had was teeming with salmon and they took the stomachs of deer and elk and they took moss and they opened up um, those reds where those uh, where the eggs of the salmon were and they put them in the moss. After they put them in the moss, they put them back in that stomach with water and they brought them back over to that stream that was having um, depletion of salmon and they recreated that nest and continued to implant. So they were doing fisheries related work from the beginning in time and they knew how to do that. We knew we were already managing the land and like Solo said, the and of this land. So it's really exciting that we're using the traditional ecological knowledge first to guide our One projects. I think a vision sometimes it is three, four, five days. And so in that, we would take the traditional, so whenever we do a project, we call our tribal elders or people, and we ask them about the area, what was there, what was found there, and they can tell you that there were so many salmon swimming in the streams, you could walk across their backs. We take their information first and bring it to the scientists and say, how can we create action plans and goals to be able to meet these? And what policies do we need to protect those? And so utilizing both those knowledges to help us direct the work that we're doing. When we're talking about these foods, we lined it up with our treaty rights and our programs. The water is related to our water resource program, fish to our fisheries. And these are subcategories, meaning that when you're talking about the fish, you're talking about all the aquatics and the resources related to them. Our deer represent the hunting rights and all the animal beings and our wildlife program. And when you're thinking about 
water, fish, and hunting, you have to look at how do you manage the habitats of those and all three of those really work in there. And then you have our root bearing plants all the way down from the small root bearing plants, not only the foods, but the encompass of all the plants. And Wiwanu represents the small shrub from the short shrub all the way to the overstory. And so first foods is a loaded concept that talks about all the resources because our elders tell us that when you look at a certain food, you can't say one's better than the other because every single plant, food, animal has a name. They have a place. They are important. Every single one of them because of what they do with one another. You can't remove them. Our cultural resource protection program looks at the, the sites and the areas related to those species and our cultural sites from before, the past, what's in the ground, above the ground, and securing the knowledge that we currently have, oral histories, and helping preservation and promote those resources. We have a first foods policy that protects and works to create policies and different visions related to the uplands vision, to the first foods vision. How do we create these policies to protect these resources? And our environmental science program to look at the air and different testing related to the plants and Hanford. And so we have all these different programs that relate to that. When we're talking about our first foods, you know, how do we do that and how's that management approach work? And our Department of Natural Resources use that mission statement to guide us. When we're talking about these foods, you also have to look at the culture and it related to, we cannot go out and gather these foods unless we have these feasts. And every year we honor and give thanks back to them. And so we have our first celery feast, our first root feast, our salmon feast, our deer, our um, feasts related to our animals, the huckleberries. And in these feasts, in these feasts is where we also teach our children and our community how to reinforce those teachings. And so when we're talking about climate change, the women see it quite often where one year we went to go gather um, bitterroot up. I think it was on the way like past Looking Glass. You're going over into the Union area. Um, and in that area, we went the same time we did the year before that the bitterroot was already turned under because we had a late, we had no snow prior. We had snow in February and it dropped really hard. And then all of a sudden, when we're usually digging that bitterroot, it was already gone. So we missed that whole window. When our first foods come forward, it is our job to go out to gather them when they're there. They do not wait for us. And as tribal people, we have a responsibility to go gather those things to go out to there. And so when you're looking at our first foods, you can look at that by this is the Umatilla watershed basin, this one white line, and this just represents how foods kind of spread across this landscape. And this over here, it represents a tribal longhouse table, which you would see the water place first, the fish species, the meat species, the root species, the berry species, we represent each one by the time that they come up in their season. And across the landscape, this is just one area. All tribes have the stretch of how their foods lay out across their landscape. And over here is a, a line of the reservation. And as you can see here, water flows all throughout the system. For about 80 years, the salmon were removed from here. We're, we're working on the restoration of that salmon throughout this waterway and the interaction of people along that fishing route and what was done before there was always fish in these streams. You have your roots on the foothills of the reservation that kind of come through. Like you see, you know, this is the reservation. We start fishing down in the Columbia. We start down low and as the time changes and the seasons change, we're moving up into the mountains to harvest those foods for our um, families, for our longhouse feasts, namings and other things that we need those foods for and then also for the health of our family and the interaction to that landscape and then towards the end of the season um in july august we're up in the mountains gathering a wiwanu huckleberries um, we're hunting our tribe unlike some of the others we have sanctioned seasons for our hunting just so we can let the um, animals rest a little bit and have a uh, a strong population 
um, within our areas. And every tribe is different. They have their own jurisdiction to set their policies how they need fit for their tribe. So from the mission statement, we created a river vision to look at what does the health of a river look like, the capability of it? How does it provide those first foods that are sustainable, the continuity of the tribe's culture, the vision that requires the river to be dynamic, the shape of it, the, phys the physicality of it, and what biological processes need to be in that river system for the interactions, the interconnections between those processes. And how do we get there? We get there by having a vision that includes hydrology, geomorphology, connectivity, riparian vegetation, and the quite, uh, aquatic biota within that river system. And to do that, you're looking at how do those things work. The hydrology, you're looking at the increase of water, the timing, how the velocity is in a river, what's the function of it, does the river down well, is the, does it have meandering channels, and how do you have all those components that help a healthy river system. One of the things that we're seeing is we're having really extreme issues related to um, the climate change and what has happened. In 2020, right before the pandemic hit, we had a massive 500 year flood. And in that, this is the area from, from Pendleton um, and it flooded from one side of the river like, all the way over. Um, down here, you can see this is one of the US Forest Service's uh, fisheries area where they raise small, I believe trout and steelhead down here and the water just inundated that. Up here on top, you see that the tribe screw traps were torn. We lost every single one of our traps and we're currently buying, borrowing traps to be able to uh, do the work that they need for our fisheries because there was so much water throughout the system, we just flood. And we had, and the, within my lifetime, I've seen like three major floods where you wouldn't see them as often because of what is going on um, climate and how do we start looking at those and addressing those. We're seeing severe um, low flows where in some areas, the river is so low, the salmon can't even pass. And the work that they're doing, they're like how do we start bringing those water back and addressing what is going on there and um, making that important. And that affects us because if those salmon can't pa pass up into the Umatilla, into the North Forks, every single one of them die in, in five years, you're gonna see the effects of them not being present in that system or what's going on with them. Uh, not only them, that the salmon is just the indicator species, you have all the other species that are affected from what's going on and the heat of that water temperature. And also when you have high water temperatures, you start seeing sickness. When I was about six years old and at that time the water was really in poor condition and there was no salmon in the river, I went down and swam in the river and I acquired some type of disease related to the water and they had only seen that disease in one other person the whole entire country and it was related to the sickness of the water so when we're talking about what happens to water i'm definitely a effect and miraculously my, my family brought me to some healers and they'd never seen it ever go away and our our culture and our faith is very strong and i was really lucky that the work that was done on me that that sickness had went away some of the other effects we're seeing is down in the big river and when the water's coming down you have the the river that's impacted by this and this is a shot of the columbia and the swell of the river and it flooding down on the other side of bonneville and going down to portland and there at it once you start seeing the impacts you have these different heavy precipitation reduced summer flows and then you have this heat and then all of a sudden if that snowpack is melted off real quick and water on top of that you start seeing these um, impacts and then in the next 50 years we're going to see much major um, impacts related to this one of our fishermen um, bud herrera was talking about in 2015 he was dip netting on the columbia river and we had a very hot summer and the waters were so hot that when he was pulling the fish out of the river down in the Columbia, he said that when he pulled them out that the skin and the flesh 
literally cooked on them and they were still alive and they were sloughing off. And so when we're talking about who do we talk to about the effects, we talk to our fishermen, the ones who that is their life. They live that every day. When, we call, when we're talking about people that fish, they're Wakanish. They're following that way of life, that Wakanish, the, the fishing life, their way of life. And they're the ones that you talk to about what effects are you seeing with traditional ecological knowledge. Our, our scientists are only out on the rivers for a certain amount of time. You have anybody that works is working maybe a, a 37 or a 40 hour work week. A third of that is going to be admin time. Another third of that's going to be travel time. And so they're only out on the rivers for a certain amount of time. But people that live this way of life, they have the knowledge of them there all the time on the rivers, the knowledge of their uncles, the people they're around, the knowledge that's passed down. They are your experts when it comes to who can tell me what is really going on out there with these species? And then putting science on top of that, it just makes you be able to manage that in a, in, in a better way. So some of the other extreme heat events was um, in the Columbia and Snake River, there was 71 degree water. And they seen over a quarter of a million sockeye die in the Columbia and Snake River in 2015. This year, we had a really big event that happened in, I think in September, the end of August, where I was down on the coast doing a presentation. And I heard on the radio that these dogs were dying. And this dog that in this picture, this is the dog that died. He went swimming, jumped in the river, and this is up in the Richland area. And later on, a couple hours later, the dog died. They had multiple other dogs that got sick or died. And what happened was there was a huge um, algae bloom that in Richland and that toxic algae that was found in there on slow moving waters. It helped elevate nutrition and fertilizers and other things and it became compound. And so currently that affected people even be able to go into the waters where they had to shut that down. Right here is a picture of Indian Wapato of our potatoes and we usually go down there in this time of year to go harvest we weren't able to go down there to harvest because of the water so toxic so we're sending our scientists down to take some level samples to see what does that look like at this time and how is that going to affect us from harvesting in the future this is um i just recently took this from the northwest network news that shows the area of the Columbia by the Yakima Delta River. And this is right around the area that we're gathering. This is what you're seeing along the banks and it's still shut down because of what's happening down there and the symptoms that are going along with that. When we're looking at extreme heat, we also need to talk to our traditional elders. One of our elders, Ramona Keona from Yakima, she was teaching us how to um, gathers the cedar root to be able to make huckleberry baskets. And as we were digging, me and her were digging, and as you see here, there's a picture of me digging this big cedar root. And we we're gathering it, and I was gathering it for the first time, and as we're gathering it, she said, that one is dying. It's dead in the middle. And I'm like, oh, okay. And she said, you want to know the reason why? She said, about 10, 15 years ago, we had an event that happened. She said, it was the same time that the salmon were bellying up in the oceans and on the river. It was so hot, it was cooking them. It also cooked the inside of our cedar trees. And she said, I never before ever seen them die in the middle of their cedar root. And so when you're looking at climate change, it not only affects what's on the ground, but what's underneath the ground and how that connects to us culturally, not only in our foods, but our cultural resources. Um, so the other things that we're seeing is we're seeing these massive forest events where you're having the fires are burning through because the forest was mismanaged in a way where tribes always culturally managed with fire where they would go in and burn different areas from year to year. And they did this until we were stopped to do that. Burning culturally promotes the they would identify different areas like huckleberry fields or other areas where you would have evasive um, natural resources that were already there, but they were a croach. They would take and burn those areas out when they would see the production of huckleberries or roots, maybe other medicines or areas where they would um, put their camps. 
that they would start encroaching. And so they would burn them out to manage those areas. And about three years later, those resources become more productive. This is in the Columbia Gorge where you see the, the smoke plume. This is in 2020 also. We had, uh, we had flood, pandemic, and smoke. And so a lot of people weren't able to go out gather how they were because it wasn't healthy for them. But our fishermen that were along the Columbia River once you're down fishing and once you have your nets in the water, you cannot leave. You can't leave those. And so our fishermen from all of our tribes were in that smoke. This picture that you see here is from the bow of the boat. This was on a clear day for about two or three weeks. Um, my boyfriend's down here on the scaffold. He said that you couldn't, he goes, I can't even see my crew members on the edge of the boat. That's how smoky it was. And they were camping in tents. They never had the chance to hardly get out of that smoke. And so we're looking at these effects that our tribal members, because they're following this way of life in these big climate effects, it is affecting them also through their health and our connection for us to be able to go out. So within that, our tribe has acquired um, air qualifiers to or air quality monitors to go in housings through grant. And we also provided tribal members. This is a picture of a lady wearing a respirator. But this year, our climate adaptation planner, she acquired masks for to hand out to traditional gatherers if they wanted to use them to be able to go out harvest in some of these big events when there's pollution that it would be harmful to health. Some of our success we have done, even though there's climate change, our people adapt. We still are out there on the grounds. We're still doing what we can to bring back our species, to fix the ecological within the river. And we have currently released 450,000 juvenile Pacific lamprey um, into the Tucannon this year. We have spent the last decade from the Walla Walla Community College, we have a wet lab there where we're raising um, Pacific lamprey from anisets or amicetes, um from the larvae all the way up. And then also we're raising mussels there. This lab is the first of its kind specifically related to starting from the bottom up. Um, there's only two other labs in the world, I think in Asia and we, <laughs> 10 years going through it, we had some die offs. We were learning because there's nobody that's doing it within this way. And so we're really excited that we finally got to the place after 10 years, 10 plus years to be able to um, successfully implant. And so within the next four, um, next several years, we're hoping to get to half a million and then beyond that. And so we're um, utilizing two cannon first and we're going to start reaching out to the other um, rivers. We created a huckleberry monitoring station to monitor the weather, the air in the area to really start looking at the huckleberry resources and to have a better picture on how we can work to restore those or what's going on with them. We have started working our climate adaptation plan and we started with a webinar series to tribal membership in our key people to look at the science, um, climate and water, climate and fish, big game, women's foods, our building system, our health, the energy, the economics. How do we create a plan that is responsive to first foods, to the culture, to the people? And so we have down here at the bottom, there's a link that you can access all those webinar series that they did. So when we're looking at that, the struggle is not yet ended. Deeds of such magnitude cannot be undone or over with, as many of you believe. They cannot stand alone a period of time. Their tentacles reach out to oncoming generations and touch the lives of the people. We live centuries after the deeds themselves, and it seems only echoes in histories. That was by Maud Antone, our chairwoman back in 1955. Everything that has happened, we are still dealing with those effects. Our people will always fight and work to restore these foods because this is our way of life. We don't have a choice. We will never leave and we'll never stop doing what we have to because we have a reciprocal responsibility to those foods first. Tribal people aren't just governed by federal laws, state laws, but we have the traditional laws first, our own policies. And then we have all those laws 
over the top. We have always governed ourselves in those resources and to this day we'll continue to do that. We have to make sure that we are securing these foods to the land for our future generations because the youth are important and passing that knowledge. A tribal fisherman can't call himself a fisherman or a hunter unless he's went out, fished, taken care of that animal. The whole entire process, cut it, gut it, cook it, hand it out, and taking care of that. He can't call himself a fisher or a hunter. We are making sure that we're securing our food so we're teaching the way it has always been meant to be teached in those traditional places on that land. Just as someone who is a doctor can't call themselves a heart surgeon unless they go into surgery, cut that heart open, repair it, and that person walks away. We are working to secure the foods how they have naturally and bring back those teachings to our people and correct those things that have left from the past. And how do we get there? And climate is a big factor and we have to make that play. Thank you. All right. All thank right. you. Thank you. Uh, I know we're at the end, end, end of our time, time as we had an hour uh, set for the meeting. And, you know, I know we wanted to leave some time for a question and answer, but uh, knowing that we've hit our, our time limit, if you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat and we will gladly uh, send those forward and, and, and uh, get, get responses to those questions. And, uh, you know, just, just any questions in general, um, you know, the Department of Energy has a, a tribal affairs program and new with the HMS contract that just began in January. Uh, we HMS has started a tribal affairs program to help uh, coordination on, on, on the contractor side, which is my role. So please feel free to reach out and uh, thank you for attending our event today. And we thank our presenters. They did an excellent job and really coincided uh, those presentations uh, you would have thought they they matched them together, but they they you know that that's just the teachings and how how native people are. So I really thank them for for their knowledge and in sharing uh, with our DUV staff today. I'm sorry for taking so long too. Like I said it's a very good presentation. <laughs> with that, uh, uh, we're we're at the end of our presentation. Uh, have a great day and. Uh, like I said, if there's any questions, just put them in the chat or, or send them our, our direction, uh, or you can send them to me or the Tribal Affairs Program for DOE, and we'll gladly help uh, to get this coordinated. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I want to give my personal thanks to Nixon Solo. This is Karen Lutz. I oversee the Tribal Affairs Program. So thank you so much for supporting that today. Very, very informative and thoughtful for our DOE team. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Good job, my Nix. I meant to put a, a, a timer on because I'm known to like go over like that and I forgot to hit start. So I was like, where? <laughs> I was like, the time and it's up. So I was like, oh my God, I forgot to set my damn timer. <laughs> I didn't want to slow your flow. You were going. So I was like, <laughs> and that's how I was so happy that I, I was telling Gabe, I was like, let's let, let's let Solo lead. And I was just like, you know, we definitely have been taught well by our elders because you have, I think that every presenter I've ever heard, you hear the same teachings just from different tribes and how they lay over the top of one, that reinforcement of them. And I've always wanted to hear you speak and I've heard good things and I definitely was, I, I definitely 
thankful to be able to hear you for once. It is um, really condensed. I, I was kind of watching my time pretty close, especially singing that song and then um, opening up with prayer. I was like, wow, shoot, don't really have that much time. So I was trying to trying to get through it as best as I could. But I thought it went really well. I, I really liked your presentation, the slides, you know, the importance of climate change and the impact that it does have. I don't think people really realize the impact that it has because the 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 time frame is getting less and less to harvest certain things as you mentioned the huckleberries the roots and even the, the animals and the birds and the fish they the time frame to gather a harvest is getting smaller and smaller and you know if, as you mentioned in your presentation we don't decide that you know and, and one of the things that's really important with with the treaties that we have is you know, we don't determine the season. The seasons determine when it's that time. And so for us as the nest purse, and I'm not sure how how the treaties are for you guys, but, you know, we hunt, we fish, we gather when it's time, not on the, according to the calendar or when they say this is the season from this time to this time because that don't determine our time. So I really appreciated that. Yeah, ours is the same too. And what we're we're really noticing is that the movement in species too, because things are climbing a little bit higher. And then once they start moving, like the roots, not as much, but you do see movement because there's a lot of encroachment of weeds. And so, and then the other thing is that tribes have to deal with is landlock. A lot of the areas that we used to be able to go into, then you come and, and you go to access an area you always hunted and all of a sudden the whole areas landlocked and so every year you have less and less areas to go be able to access areas to go practice those and it's just one of the other parts that we're working on for my program is i go out and do what we call um first foods recon where i'm looking at areas to find more food resources or even identify sources that we're not harvesting where they are and taking gps units and starting to create a mapping system of where they are so we can develop maps for tribal membership and how and is it open land is it non-open land and bringing people out on excursions where we're teaching them the difference and how to read those maps because we do have people that are crossing areas and you know doing things that can get them in trouble where they jeopardize their treaty rights and how can we teach our younger generation that might not have those teachers or those cultural knowledge people within their families or some of their families don't have no connection with them or we have people that are urban that are trying to come back or relearn their culture and they have those rights or, or they they suddenly found they were adopted out or something and they try to come back home and how can we create a safe space for them and go out with groups of people and so part of my job is on, on that side too and there's just so many um within there it just like any other tribe it's just there's so many variables and really working to start reaching out to other tribes like how can we start working together more because they made us so separate that we fight among each other and and that doesn't work if we could find more and just figure out how do we work together and not only that because every tribe has where we have lost knowledge and if like when we started to reconnect with the camas it'd been so long because the resource was not here and so we waited for it to come back and we had to reach out to people in warm springs that were also Cayuse and Springers and people from Lapway to help us to reteach us how to do the earth ovens, how to go out and harvest where that knowledge had been lost and vice versa. We have things that are found here that aren't found in your guys' area, but we used to always share as families and come back together and our policies have been so tight where it's individualized us where we have fathers that are here that are from this person they can't bring their kids out and who's going to teach them and then if they bring them their kids home to Nez Perce, there's policies that they probably can't hunt for and so we've been looking at some of those policies how do we change those where we're getting less and less and less and we still have to figure out a way to continue to 
teach our, our people, but some of our policies are so back-ended that we jeopardize our own teaching to those youth and how to, it's just, we used to all go out together. So we, we, that we're looking at those policies and how to loosen them up in some areas, but still it, it's, there's always complications. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's right. Well, you even, you even look at our, our law and order codes. They're not, they're not written according to our treaties. You know, we've adopted even our law and order codes are adopted by other tribes or even by counties and state laws, not according to our laws. And so I think they need to revisit that and look at those because it does, you know, it does impact our children and our youth. And it, it does impact the relationship that we ha we've always had, you know, I, I think about some of the words of Chief Joseph and some of the great chiefs, you know, the land isn't ours to do with as we please. The one who created it is the one who does with the land that he pleases. So, you know, there's so much division and there's so much, you know, selfishness, I think. Well, this is mine or this is ours. And, you know, Traditionally and culturally, we all shared the resources. We all shared the land. And so those things are really important that, you know, I think for you as an educator and myself and Gabe and, and other people that are in education um, really need to educate people on, on that relationship, on the importance of unity and being stewards, caretakers and all, all those kinds of things. That's, it's really important. You know, we, it's something that we carry and we have to pass it on. I really see that coming together more too with our younger generation. A lot of us know each other too. And so we're wanting to work with one another and combining. And I think the one thing that's been great about the pandemic is because it made us have to connect virtually and it made our people who never wanted anything recorded. They, would, they told us, don't record, don't document, don't get on you know and then all of a sudden they were forced to and because of that it cracked into nations open to where before they wouldn't re record they wouldn't be seen on video and now you see elders getting on there you see people embracing technology to pass the culture and i think if you look at the last two years that probably the sharing of culture and first foods and the work we've done has probably doubled or tripled in some some ways where I can get online and, and sit in on meetings from across the country where I would never, ever been able to do that before. And our younger generation is phenomenal. It's just breaking them out in a whole different way with them being able to have a platform to show their voice or show what they're doing related to their jobs or to um where they're at or even like the models in the fashion industry and how they took the like their businesses it just it's amazing what our indonesian has done in such a short time once they embraced a technology we never have embraced like that before and i'm really proud of where we're moving to and, and just hearing the voice people have had which they never had before yeah that's right you know with the with the pandemic and being restricted to travel and, and meet and do certain things, I've utilized social media as a platform for these kinds of things. And it's it has really helped, you know, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, a lot of those social media sites I utilize as a platform to help educate people and, you know, to to be uplifted and to share. But um, yeah, that's right, man. It's it's crazy, you know. Even with, you know, one of the things we've been doing here is our cultural resources. They have been interviewing elders a lot more because that knowledge is invaluable. Mm -hmm. You know, if if we lose it, we lose it. You know, like you're saying. But even for me, you know, with some of the songs, they said, "Don't like you mentioned, don't sing that song." But if we don't record it and we don't share it, who's gonna have it? Who's gonna pick it up? And so there's songs that I sing that were given specifically to me or, or songs that 
the creator gave to me that I sing only at certain times and I'll sing it on LinkedIn. I'll sing it on Facebook or Messenger or whatever it is because people need certain things at a certain time and we don't dictate that. Just like the seasons, we don't dictate that. We we have to be ready all the time. And so those things are really important. And that's never how it used to be. And I liked when you talked about where as educators, and that's how I was taught too, is that that knowledge does not belong to you. It's handed down. And if and what we're seeing is people weren't sharing. And so once they pass, they take all that. And each tribe, there's only 3,000 of us. And there's only a fraction of us that are cultural knowledge keepers. And once you leave and you're not passing that knowledge, you're taking that. There's 3,000 of us and how many billion in that in this world so that teaching is more valuable than a precious gem because we never once it's gone and they're in the ground we never get that back so as educators we have it and even when we get flack i i <laughs> i get in the firing zone but it is our job to pass those teachings because like your dad your your dad was just like my dad. That's what me and Aqua and them, we always connected because we both had so many different things related and the teachings were, were the same as it. it's not your knowledge to keep. And not only that, you have to spread out and teach other people because people have to understand where we come from as Native Americans to be able to understand. We're people that we, once we learn all people, you know, we can understand that better. And we might take something and maybe not, but if we can reach one person, then we're that much better off. And and our us native people, this is a place that talks to us, not only from those teachings, but from those uh, that ilikai, that healing light of the ground, and how it moves through us and that connection. Because when we go to sleep, those foods talk to us when we're in our dreams. They come to us and they sing to us, and we see them in our dreams, and it tells us. You know, it's time to come and we hear them singing that the connection is really different for us. And when we're out harvesting and gathering and doing roots, I'll be driven for days and days and days of what was going on with that or what I heard or the songs that are coming. It's those connections because we're so connected because we've never lost this place, left this place where we have a lot of our brothers and sisters from other countries or are that have been in this country so long that they they have lost their original connection and everybody's yearning to have that. And so we have great people, non-native that um, they're working for that to find those connections or they have, every family has their own cultural connections within their families and their teachings. Yeah, that's that's right. Um, I know there's a, a few people still on here, but um, I wanted to, I want to sing a healing song because I have to head out too. I have another meeting this afternoon, but I want to he sing a healing song that was given specifically to me. Nobody else sings it, and and I sing it at sweat on, on certain times, but I sing it for the land, for the earth, but also people that are going through difficult times. Now I know we've we've had a lot of loss on our reservations and in our communities, and in our families, and it's been tough. But also I think about the animals the birds the fish as as you mentioned and not just native but also non-native people have really been going through a lot of a lot of stuff in this this pandemic and the sickness and being restricted it it's taken its toll but i want to sing this healing song and then i'll i'll have to log off but i just wanted to share this song and for all you that are still on here i'm thankful that you guys stayed on but i'm going to sing this song before we log off today
log off but i really appreciate all of you staying on here and listening and if you have anything and I, I noticed someone else is on there um but thanks gabe i really appreciate it and the people that supported this and sponsored this it's a it's a great idea and it's a great time and thanks my next for your words your presentation and you know keep up the good work that's what we need appreciate it yeah thank you i it definitely was a good day for me thank you gabe yeah, thank you guys again. Thank you as well. You guys hit a home run. Get on comments back, read my emails. So uh, we'll, we'll be sending you guys a thank you here here probably shortly, or uh, uh, somebody above me will, or for, for DUE. So. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Yeah, and I just wanted to say thank you all as well. I, Gabe works uh, kind of with me for me. I, I'm with HMIST and um, have the scope for the tribal nations uh work here and so i really appreciate your presentations i felt like i was kind of eavesdropping on a conversation for the last little bit but i'm i'm glad you didn't kick me off because i i do enjoy listening to what you have to say and it was a great presentation today hope we'll meet in person someday yeah we never really get a chance to to talk crossways like that and, and those are important subject matters so it, it, it gives you a more in-depth the, the personal side uh, of what that is related to the work we do. So thank you. Before I log off, I just wanted to remind you guys that we um, we have our 12th annual STEM fair coming up Thursday, December 2nd. And it's at our community center over here. And we've invited different agencies, different colleges, different universities, different tribal programs. And we've we've been given the OK to have it. So we're going forward with it. So if you're interested, and for you as well, Wanix, if you want to bring students over, we're, we've got students from Umatilla before, but also we invite school districts on or near the reservation. So would it, you know, if you guys wanted to come over, that'd be awesome. And some of the um, representatives that are on here, if you're interested, um, email me. My email's on the chat box. Um, I could send you a registration packet and a flyer for you, but um, I just wanted to announce that um, Thursday, December 2nd, our yeah, 12th annual STEM fair. And I could pass it along to Julie Taylor, who is, they have that tribal youth council, and we're just, we're just today, the last couple of days, our mandates have lifted a little bit for our COVID restrictions. And so I definitely can pass that around. And that might be something that they might be interested in and they might have the go ahead to be able to do that because we're we've been locked down pretty strict for several months now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, you guys. I got a, jump right. off have a good afternoon. meeting coming up. Thank you. See you guys later. Right. Thank you.